Today's Monday at Beinecke Gallery Talk program jumps off from this new display of images on the library's exterior ground floor windows. My colleagues Nancy Cool, Melissa Barton, and Tobias Cropper and I will be doing a lightning round of comments on seven of the people pictured. On the building's east side, facing Hewitt Quadrangle, this new exhibition begins with text from the opening lines of Langston Hughes's poem, Let America Be America Again. I encourage you to visit the library's YouTube channel and watch and listen to a new reading of this iconic Hughes poem by Yale Divinity School professor Willie Jennings. To the right of the Hughes text are a series of images from color photographs taken by Carl Van Vechten, founder of the James Weldon Johnson Memorial Collection of African American Arts and Letters. My colleagues and I highly recommend our dear friend Emily Bernard's biography of Carl Van Vechten to you. You can find a link to a talk Emily gave on Van Vechten and to her biography on the Binding Library website at the address you see on your screen. Van Vechten was an early, near immediate, and very enthusiastic adopter of the use of Kodachrome film in 1939, adding color to his photographic practice. He set out then to photograph every Black American cultural figure he possibly could, producing an extraordinary catalog of more than 2,000 slides, which came to the Beinecke Library after his death in 1964. These photographs are among the most popular items in the Beinecke Library's digital collections and on our social media platforms. They bring the people they document to life. And today, Nancy, Melissa, Tobias, and I will use these photographs to offer brief insights on seven of the 14 people portrayed in the images on the current Beinecke Library outdoor display. We will come back on December 7th and do the next seven. Our conversation today will of necessity not be encyclopedic. Rather, we hope to interest, inspire, and even incite you to search some more, look some more, and read some more on your own. We will use the windows and these new photographs on display as a jumping off point, and we hope our remarks might be a jumping off point for you to explore further on your own. Let us begin. Nancy. Hello. I begin today with the assumption that you are all familiar, at least somewhat, with the great American poet Langston Hughes one of the most prominent figures of the period known as the Harlem Renaissance, and one of the most widely read and most beloved American poets of the 20th century. So instead of repeating biographical details you may well be familiar with, today I'll say a few words about the Langston Hughes papers at the Beinecke Library, one of the core collections of the James Weldon Johnson Memorial Collection of African American Arts and Letters, and consistently the most frequently consulted collection in the entirety of the Beinecke Library. The most frequently consulted collection at the Beinecke Library, another way to say this. The more than 600 boxes in Langston Hughes's papers make up an extraordinarily rich collection that helps us access this writer's creative process, artistic community, community, cultural moment, wider world, as well as intimate details of his family and personal life. Or I might say it this way, this is an archive that seems never to give up all its secrets a collection that keeps revealing the complexity and depths of Hughes's creativity and intellect, his life, his relationships and community, and the times in which he lived. Over years of working with this collection, the Hughes papers, has all, Hughes papers have also helped me think about archives more generally, offering ways of imagining and understanding the past through individual minds and lives and works of art. Michael, will you turn to the next slide, please? One instance of this, I've learned from Hughes's papers many ways to think about the, the human mind in the act of making art. 
Take, for example, Hughes's poem pictured here, the, the work that includes the famous lines, what happens to a dream deferred. A version of this is circled about two thirds of the way down this page. These lines are so woven into the fabric of our culture that maybe, like me, you were thrilled but not exactly surprised to hear President-elect Joe Biden quote them in a recent speech. When we encounter language that is beautiful and memorable in the ways this poem is, it is easy for us to experience it as eternal and inevitable. And we might have guessed that writing these lines come, came, came, excuse me, came easily to a brilliant poet like Langston Hughes. But his in-process drafts show how hard he worked and how through rewriting and revision, he found his way from an initial idea to an unforgettable poem. We can learn from Hughes's heavily worked and reworked drafts that when we think of poets channeling muses or grabbing poems perfect and complete out of the air, we might be obscuring one of the most fascinating things about poems. They are the work of the human mind, encountering the world, expressing experience and idea, making indelible new forms of meaning and beauty. And a literary archive can give us the privilege of seeing a great mind in the act of making timeless art. I find this to be at once both grounding and inspiring, and it is nowhere more true than in the papers of Langston Hughes. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, both people I have the pleasure of speaking about today are, in, are strong contenders for greatest friend ever to the James Weldon Johnson Memorial Collection. And the first of those is Dorothy Peterson. Dorothy Peterson was the daughter of Jerome Bowers Peterson, who co-founded the prominent black newspaper, The New York Age. And she spent formative years living in Venezuela and Puerto Rico while her father was posted as consul and a tax collector for the IRS respectively. She emerged from these experiences with a lifelong interest in Latinx literatures and cultures. After returning to New York and training at NYU and Columbia, she taught Spanish in the New York public schools for her entire career. And if you could go to the next slide, please. In the top picture, she is um, in the center with the Spanish club at Bushwick High School where she taught. You can't really tell, um, you can't really pick her out from that huge mass of teenagers, but she's right in the middle. Um, Peterson was friends with and acquainted with many Harlem Renaissance writers, including a close friendship with Nella Larson, the novelist, and a love affair with Jane Toomer. And she is often unfairly remembered as just a friend, as someone who was also there. She acted in both um, professional and amateur productions. She took a year off from teaching to, to, to appear in The Green Pastors. Um, and Peterson also aspired to write. She even completed the manuscript of a novel. This may have been partly the spirit of the age. In one of her letters to Peterson, Nella Larson writes, Dorothy, you'd better write some poetry or something. I've met a man from Macmillan's who asked me to look out for any Negro stuff and send them to him. But um, I prefer the suggestion of Melanie Chambliss, who was a graduate student at Yale and in her 2016 doctoral dissertation, she argues that the James Weldon Johnson Memorial Collection was Peterson's creative contribution to the era. Peterson herself donated dozens of books and serials, including our only issues of the gossipy interstate tattler, plus letters from many correspondents, which are gathered into a collection that bears her name. Uh, Jerome Bowers Peterson, at his daughter's urging, donated over 400 titles to the JWJ collection. Um, Yale librarian James Babb at the time called this gift the second most important after Van Vechten's own. Dorothy wrote to friends soliciting donations for the JWJ collection. When she traveled to Puerto Rico shortly after the collection's opening, founding, she brought home or arranged for donations from several Afro-Puerto Rican poets. In an autobiographical sketch, she noted that she was, uh, quoting, trained from an early age, a very early age to collect material for newspaper articles and biographical sketches because of her father's journalism career. Um, and she became a great contributor to the JWJ collection's subject file frequently sending clippings, theater and concert programs and mailings to Yale to be filed. When Grace Nail Johnson, paralyzed with grief and indecision after her husband's death, hesitated to begin organizing and sending his papers for the collection, it was Dorothy Peterson who visited her. And um, the other picture here is the two of them, um, it's Dorothy on the left and Grace on the right at Five Acres, the Johnson summer home in Great Barrington in the Berkshires. Dorothy Peterson's devotion to the JWJ collection made her an obvious choice to hire as a curator. 
and she was the third person discussed for the job after Harold Jackman and Arna Bontemps. But even though university librarian Bernard Nolenberg expressed a strong commitment to the idea of hiring a member of the Black community to curate the James Weldon Johnson Memorial Collection, it's not clear how much they really wanted to go through with this. It doesn't seem that Yale ever got to the point of actually making an offer to anyone. Um, and in Peterson's case, Nolenberg expressed concerns about a lack of library training, that the salary would be too low to entice her away from her teaching job. <laughs> And uh, in a kind of grim variation on it's not you, it's me, they worried that the race relations in provincial New Haven would appall someone as worldly as Peterson. Peterson seems to have given up on the job prospect, but she continued to stir up donations and to send them herself throughout her life. And if we consider this collection to be her life's greatest contribution, then I would say the rest of us should be so lucky to make such a contribution. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, I have the honor of presenting um, Grace Nail Johnson. Uh, I'm sure some may know of her, but a lot others don't know of her. Um, you know, she's more, more commonly known as the wife of the poet, the, the civil rights activist, uh, James Walden Johnson. Um, but Grace is also known as sort of the, the grand dame of Harlem, was uh, a popular hostess who brought together um, Harlem's artistics and, you know, political elites and, you know, uh, figures of uh, that time. Um, you can go to the next slide there, Michael. Uh, I was looking in the digital library and wasn't able to find too much uh, for Grace. You know, majority of the stuff in the DL is more um, towards James Weldon Johnson, but I figure I'd show a few uh, pictures of her in her younger years just to give, a, you know, an example of some of the personal things that are in these collections at the Beinecke. Um, and I figured I'd just give a quick little uh, background talk uh, about Grace. Uh, she was born in, in New London, I believe. Um, and she was the daughter of uh, a real estate developer. Um, her father was a uh, first life member of the NAACP, I believe. Um, so she was, she was raised and born into a very, uh, well-known family and Grace was, uh, you know, the daughter of well and respected people in New York um, and met her future husband uh, when she was a teenager. I uh, put that second picture there on the right to give some sort of reference to her, her younger years. I'm not entirely sure if she was a teenager in that photograph, but um, it seems pretty close, uh, 15 years her senior was James Weldon Johnson. And um, I believe they met in Venezuela. And uh, when they returned to New York, I believe they married in 1910 and returned to New York and the Johnsons moved to Harlem uh, where they became sort of central figures of the Harlem Renaissance. Uh, Grace was one of the most celebrated hostesses of that time entertaining, you know, uh, a lot of the elites, as I said. And in addition to that, uh, Ms. Johnson worked in support of a number of important civil rights groups fighting for uh, equal job opportunities for men and women of color uh, and for equal pay for African-American workers, most of whom you know, then made significantly less than their white counterparts uh, in that same field. Um, as a result of her valuable work, her high profile and you know her generous sort of spirit, Johnson became uh, a mentor to a lot of younger African American women. And uh, unfortunately, on June 1960, or I'm sorry, not 60, 1938, 39, uh, Grace was in that serious car accident with her husband in Maine, um, where uh, she was seriously injured and her husband died. Uh, more than 2,000 plus people were at that funeral. And, um, you know, this led to this collection being established. The James Weldon Johnson collection uh, at the Beinecke Library is one of the most consulted collections. And uh, it, was, it was started by his, James Weldon Johnson's best friend, really, um, Carl Van Vechten, who is responsible for these beautiful photographs we're talking about today. Um, and he, uh, 
wanted to create a collection in his honor. So that's where this whole thing comes in. Um, I believe when he was putting or donating things to Yale, they hadn't had uh, a very large Negro uh, collection at all, which you know enticed him to give that collection. And following that gift, um, Grace Nail Johnson contributed her late husband's papers, leading you know the way for gifts of papers from people like Langston Hughes, W. E. B. Du Bois, uh, you know um, Dorothy Peterson, Harold Jackman, etc. And um, that collection today is around thirteen thousand volumes and hundreds of linear feet of of manus uh, manuscripts and uh, different material. So Grace was a big reason for this collection. And unfortunately, I wasn't able to put a lot together from the digital library, but it certainly does. Um, uh, she is a, a huge inspiration to uh, a lot of other African American um, artists and political elites as well. Mike? Dr. W. E. B. Du Bois is one of the greatest minds of our nation. And he had great style. When I tweeted this image earlier this year from the Beinecke Library Twitter, it generated enormous, and for us, uh, enormous for us reaction. Almost 400 retweets, nearly 2,000 likes. Among the comments, and I quote, were, wow, I've never seen a photo of him in color, LOL. And, quote, I thought this guy died like in 1890. And, quote, such a handsome man. I don't think I've ever seen a color photo of him. And many, many more that talked about how the color photograph brought Du Bois to life. That's the power of the photos by Van Vechten. They bring people to life and they remind us the past may not be as far past as we think. In these United States of amnesia, we would do well to remember more and remember better. And in that spirit, jumping off from the Van Vechten photo of Du Bois that brings Du Bois to life, I recommend reading, or for some, rereading Du Bois's epic 1935 book, Black Reconstruction, the first edition of which you see on the screen here, the cover. We may in this nation be on the cusp of a third reconstruction. If we are, and if we are to get it right, we would all do well to return to Du Bois's account of the first reconstruction. His is a landmark work that honored and centered the agency of Black people in American history. In this book, Du Bois set out, and I quote from him, how the facts of American history have in the last half century been falsified because the nation was ashamed. The South was ashamed because it fought to perpetuate human slavery. The North was ashamed because it had to call in the black men to save the union, abolish slavery and establish democracy." Close quote. Du Bois, by honestly centering Black people as actors in history, was doing something radical. He knew this, and I again quote this from his preface, quote, I am going to tell this story as though Negroes were ordinary human beings realizing that this attitude will from the first seriously curtail my audience. Du Bois was a truth teller. Another quote with resonance for us today about the intersection of race 
and economics. Du Bois wrote, quote, it was not then race and culture calling out of the South in 1876. It was property and privilege. Shrieking to its own kind and privilege and property heard and recognized the voice of its own, close quote. I would submit if you care about freedom, if you care about democracy, if you care about America, if you care about the past, the present and the future, read this book. Thank you, Michael. Um, and the second one that I will be discussing is the great uh, essayist, playwright, novelist, um, and voice of the American Civil Rights Movement, um, James Baldwin, known for works such as Notes of a Native Son, uh, The Fire Next Time, Go Tell It on the Mountain, things of that nature. Um, the the James Baldwin early manuscripts and papers, uh, you know, is only about six boxes or six plus boxes and contain, you know, material documenting a short period of Baldwin's young adult life between uh, 41 to 45, um, when Baldwin was sort of just beginning his literary career. Um, you know, written in the, I, I decided I wanted to read a part of one of his works. And I wanted to talk about Notes of a Native Son, as you see here, uh, written during the 1940s and 50s, uh, when he was only in his 20s, I believe, the essays you know, collected in this Notes of a Native Son captured a view of Black life and Black thought at the dawn of the civil rights movement. And as the movement slowly gained strength through uh, you know, the words of one of the most captivating essayists and foremost intellectuals um, of that era. Uh, it introduced Baldwin as one of the leading interpreters of the dramatic social changes, uh, you know, coming about in the United States in the 20th century. And many of his observations have been proven almost, you know, prophetic in a way. Um, he was also one of the few writing on race at the time who addressed the issues of, of two things. It was sort of a mixture of his outrage at the, the physical and political violence, but also, you know, it was, he was measuring the understanding of their oppressors and things of that nature. So I'm just gonna read uh, one part from Notes of a Native Son. Uh, and it starts, I don't like people who like me because I am a Negro. Neither do I like people who find it in some accident grounds for contempt. I love America more than any country in the world. And exactly for this reason, I insist on the right to criticize her perpetually. I think all theories are suspect that the finest principles may have to be modified or may even be pulverized by the demands of life. And that one must find, therefore, one's own moral center and move through the world, hoping that this center will guide one aright. I consider that I have many responsibilities, but none greater than this. To last, as Hemingway says, and get my work done. I want to be an honest man and a good writer. Thanks, Mike. Okay, um, Harold Jackman is sometimes remembered as the face of the Harlem Renaissance or Harlem's handsomest man for reasons I suspect I don't need to explain, except to note that Jackman was the model, and can we go to the next slide, for the 1925 portrait by Vinyl Reese seen here called A College Lad, included in the special issue of Survey Graphic Magazine that would become the landmark anthology, The New Negro, the, the kind of the most important collective book project of that period. Um, the portrait with its title is emblematic of the way the Harlem Renaissance idealized the intersection of youth and intellectualism. 
And Jackman was the consummate cultured young person of the day, serving as the model not only for the college lad, but also characters in multiple novels. He was born in 1901. Um, so it, when this portrait is taken, he's 24 years old. Um, he was born in London to a Barbadian mother and a German father. He taught social studies, read widely, participated in amateur and semi-professional theater, and was a member of the circle of younger Black writers and artists of the Harlem Renaissance that included Langston Hughes, Richard Bruce Nugent, Wallace Thurman, Gwendolyn Bennett, Zora Neale Hurston, and County Cullen. Cullen was his best friend. They attended high school together at the story DeWitt Clinton High and went together to NYU. Jackman was the best man at Cullen's wedding to Yolanda Du Bois, the daughter of W.E.B. Du Bois. Both Cullen and Jackman were participants in Harlem's underground queer community. Jackman regularly attended the famous Hamilton Lodge drag balls. And neither was out at the time, but it was rumored even at the time that Cullen and Jackman were romantically involved. When they sailed to Europe together not long after the wedding, uh, and Yolanda stayed back in New York, the headlines read, Groom Sales with Best Man. When Van Vechten established the James Weldon Johnson Memorial Collection, Jackman was one of the collection's most active supporters. He donated dozens of his own books, as well as his correspondence from a dozen or more figures, including Hughes and Cullen, Claude McKay, and Gwendolyn Bennett. And a uh, side note here, th these are not cataloged under a Harold Jackman collection or as his papers, uh, but they can be pulled together by searching for his name. Jackman submitted hundreds of newspaper clippings and ephemera over the years to the subject file I mentioned earlier, which is now known as the clippings file of the JWJ collection. Um, as I mentioned uh, earlier, Jackman was also considered for the curator position. It seems he took himself out of contention, citing the low salary. Uh, it may surprise a lot of people to learn that academic librarians routinely make less than school teachers, but it's true to this day. Um, and he also wanted to keep his teaching pension. Um, still, Jackman played a key role in building the collection, often serving as Van Vechten's intermediary, even with Langston Hughes. Um, even though Jackman himself told Van Vechten in a letter, you know Langston better than I do. Um, and he's pictured here, he's uh, on, all the way on the right with Arna Bontemps in the middle and Langston Hughes in the front in a photograph taken by Van Vechten. Um, thanks to Emily Bernard, we now know the extent to which Van Vechten felt compelled to pester and hound, maybe even harangue um, Langston Hughes to organize his materials and send them in. Sometimes they were sent in a folder at a time. Um, and uh, so in such situations with your friend, it's often useful to have a third person to help you out. And, and that person was Harold Jackman sometimes. Um, Jackman stepped in as collector on at least one occasion that we know of. He retrieved his own letters to Hughes and routed them to Van Vechten for the collection on December 25th, 1941. as a kind of present to Van Vechten. Um, and he included a note assuring uh, Van Vechten that none of the letters needed to be sealed for any period of time. Jackman was inspired by the founding of the JWJ collection to establish his own collection at Atlanta University, now Clark Atlanta, um, an HBCU that is the alma mater of James Weldon Johnson. When County Cullen died in 1946, and he was just 42 years old, he renamed the collection in honor, uh, Jackman renamed the collection in honor of his friend. So it's now known as the County Cullen Harold Jackman Memorial Collection. It's 65 linear feet of documents that Jackman solicited documenting black creativity. This includes clippings and ephemera, much like you, what you would find in the clippings file of the James Olden Johnson collection, as well as representative manuscripts from Langston Hughes, James Baldwin, Paul Lawrence Dunbar, Rose McClendon, Arabelle Thompson, and others. It's a really amazing collection. Um, there's sheet music, photographs. The largest series in the collection is materials from cultural productions. So I like to imagine Harold Jackman going to the theater and taking home two programs, sending one to Atlanta for the Colin Jackman collection and another to Yale for the James Fulton Johnson collection. Thank you. I'm delighted to be able to talk with you uh, today about Margaret Bonds. Um, Bonds was a composer associated with the later Harlem Renaissance. Now perhaps she is best known for her settings of works by and collaborations with the poet Langston Hughes. Born in 1913, Margaret Bonds was the daughter of, of a physician, her father, and a music teacher, her mother, who was also a hostess to Chicago's African-American musicians and artists. Bonds' mother taught her to play piano from the time she was a very small child. At 16 in 1929, 
Bonds enrolled as a student at Northwestern. There, racist policies allowed her to attend classes, but not to use many campus facilities, including a library. So Bond studied at her local public library, and it was there that she first read Langston Hughes's poems. Of this experience, she wrote, I was in this prejudiced university, this terribly prejudiced place. I was looking in the basement of the Evanston Public Library where they had, where they had the poetry. I encountered this wonderful poem, The Negro Speaks of Rivers, and I'm sure it helped my feelings of security. Because in that poem, Langston Hughes tells how, the, how great the black man is. And if I had any misgivings, which I would have to have, here you are in a setup where the restaurants won't serve you, and you're going to college, you're sacrificing, trying to get through school, and I know that poem helped save me. Before she was 20, she began winning prizes for her compositions. And while she was still a student at 22, Bonds became the first black soloist to appear with the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. After finishing undergraduate and graduate degrees at Northwestern and going on to collaborate with many Chicago area musicians, she moved to New York in 1939. There she met Langston Hughes and eventually wrote the compositions she is best known for, including a setting of the Negro Speaks of Rivers, which, she had, which had been so important to her as a young artist. Michael, will you change the slide, please? Her works were long represented in the James Weldon Johnson Memorial Collection in published scores, letters in the archives of friends, especially Hughes, and in photographs like those taken by Carl Van Vechten. But it's only relatively recently, in 2012, that the library was able to acquire six boxes of papers, mostly scores, some of which we pre were previously not known. Our collection adds to a 15 box collection of Margaret Bond's papers at Georgetown University. There is more to Bond's work than her famous settings of Hughes's poems or the other works we know well. And this is why I wanted to show you this list of works from her papers. To me, it is kind of a symbol because scholars speculate that only about half of the compositions Bond made in her lifetime are extant and only about a quarter of her scores were ever published. And now because copyright complexities make her work challenging to perform or to publish, um, there's still so much we do not know about her work. So my introduction to her then is also an invitation to students and researchers. Please come and investigate the Bonds papers at the Beinecke Library. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa, Nancy, and Tobias. And I think Nancy's uh, final note uh, of an invitation is exactly the right way for us to close these opening remarks. We do hope that you all will see these photos, whether you see them in person or online, and will choose to learn more, see them as an invitation. We'd be happy if there are any thoughts or questions uh, that people have now. And as we have said in these sessions and others, uh, you also should feel free to email us at the Beinecke Library or email any of us individually at firstname.lastname at yale.edu um, with thoughts. And we do hope you will join us on December 7th, where if I were to do sort of be a barker, you'll have Ella Fitzgerald and Zora Neale Hurston and five other greats uh, brought to you by my terrific colleagues. <laughs>